So good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone. I'm Francesco De Luca from um, the response team of CSI uh, Piemonte in Italy. Uh, our speech will be about a serious ransomware attack we suffered uh, recently and uh, from which we learned some interesting things. <clears throat> uh, I'll take just a few minutes to explain the context, uh, uh, the customers and the services we deliver, as well as the, the rationale we adopt for asset protection. But the most interesting stuff would be in the Paolo presentation. So I will boring you just for a few minutes. Uh, JCPMOT is one of the most important Italian tech companies that uh, creates digital services for regional and the national public administration. Uh, just a few notes about our infrastructure and services. We have a data center, certified TIA, Resin 3, we are a certified cloud service provider. We obviously are an accredited regional CCERT. We manage the whole regional connectivity network. And we deployed a smart data platform for big data that is unique in Italy. Uh, a little more figures. We have a 130, more than 130 consortium members, uh, two data centers. Uh, we employ more than 1,000 professionals with more than 2,000 services that we monitor 24 seven. In this context, uh, how we protect our data, just using defense in depth, uh, that you know is an information assurance approach where uh, several layer of defense are stationed all through an IT system. This approach tackles security vulnerabilities in uh, technologies, human resources, and of course operation throughout the whole system's life cycle. Um, Defense Index has different control, but just talking about uh, technical control, so we know that these comprise uh, security essential in order to secure network system or resource through specified hardware or software. Uh, you know that uh, these controls refer to the software security measures that are installed in the IT infrastructure you have to protect, such as uh, IDS, IPS, uh, web application firewalls, uh, uh, biometrics, uh, password manager, VPN, and so on. But, but, uh, to put this attack in the correct context, uh, is important to consider that our consortium is made up of 130 national government agencies. These are entities of very different size, ranging from a, a few employees to thousands of employees. Moreover, we deliver more than 2,000 services, but not all are on all customers. Maybe we have a capillary control of services and infrastructure for our customers or for some of them, while for others, we only deliver some other services. And uh, the same is true for cybersecurity. For some customer, we protect the whole infrastructure, or maybe that we manage security only for 
little service for just for some services to other customers. So we have a really, a really varied scenario. And uh, now what happens when you are attacked on such a large and heterogeneous surface? Happens that the response team entered the field and uh, an exciting lesson starts. And now I leave the word to Paolo. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. I need the screen. Okay. And here we go. Okay, so let's have a short journey into the receiving end of a ransomware attack. Uh, the following slides are dedicated to those of you who have not been yet part of this game. And I hope it's the majority of you because it's very good experience, very emotional, but very hard. So uh, the previous attacks we had to handle where in 2014, so that pretty a long time ago, where users were falling victim of CryptoLocker on their machines. So they were getting data encrypted on their local disks and mounted the network drives. So that was easy, just restore the machine and the data from the backups. But then we got our first large scale ransomware attack in by the end of 2000. 21, so last year. Uh, as Francesco said before, uh, the victim had a hybrid configuration. So they, they, they buy email, the email platform is in the cloud on which we have no visibility at all, no logs and no content. Also the internal network devices like routers and switches, we have no visibility because they are handled by a third party company. Of course, we cooperate with them, but we don't get the logs. Fortunately, the firewalls, the more important ones, like the one towards internet and towards us and our cust other customers, they are managed by us, so we get the logs. Uh, the domain controllers is under our control, as well as their logs, and the endpoint security. This means the classical antivirus product, so nothing really fancy. And as a part of our defense, we also use commercial and free platforms that monitor the internet facing systems. They look like, they look for vectors, risk vectors like uh, old or insecure TLS SSL configurations. They warn you if there are some unpatched or outdated systems as well as if some the IP starts offering services on an open without encryption or unsecured port. Well, how could that happen? We sell also just the connectivity. So in our cloud platform, for example, so one of our customers and consortium members can come to us, just buy an IP address and start uh, giving services like a, a remote desktop or an FTP without any encryption out to the whole internet. So we get notices from that. And, and also the missing security application headers that are in some cases are not so easy to implement on older systems. We also use uh, other services that report the outgoing traffic towards malicious IPs like honeypots or IP networks that were seized by the police forces. So all these sources are extremely useful to assess and reduce the exposure, but they were not enough. How did they get in? How did we get the ransomware attack? Did they use a remote code execution? No, we have protection for that. Did they use a zero day? No. Did they maybe use a CV exploit? No, they, were, they, they came before the log4j, by the way. They just came through one, one stolen remote desktop credential. So this was the, the first lesson we learned very hard, but it's nothing new. 
actually, is that the human factor bypassed thousands of years worth of defense technologies. After that, the actor just followed step by step the Conti playbook. The day after we learned that the Conti playbook had been released, let's say, and it was available on internet, and it was very useful reading through it to follow the steps of the attacker into the network of our customer. Anyway, uh, from the analysis of the lateral movement and the timeline of the attack, we also learned a few things that we actually reused uh, in, the coming month, in the coming months. So the first use of the stolen credential was two days before the weekend break. That means Thursday for us. And the reconnaissance took place during working hours on Thursday and Friday. So both the actual user and the attacker were using the systems during working hours, nine to five. So there were no real alerts triggering. And then finally, he came back on Saturday afternoon or evening, something like that, and launched encryption uh, that went through until someone noticed. This is pretty standard stuff, I think, as what, from what I've read of ransomware attacks. So those of you that are uh, that have been in the security field for uh, maybe a decade have probably heard of the statistic that a certain percentage of servers is forgotten every year in every data center. That means that uh, like one, two or 5% of servers becomes forgotten because the maintainer goes, leaves or because nobody uses it but forgot to switch it off and uh, release it. And well, we discovered during the ransomware attack that this statistic applies to endpoints as well. Actually applied probably to endpoints, but it was the case. So just imagine a customer with 10,000 seats, and even if just 1% per year uh, of, the, uh, of the computers become forgotten, that means really a lot. Uh, so that's how it, it came, uh, the encryption. The first systems to be exploited were some personal under the desk servers that were powered up 24 seven. Maybe now they're not so common anymore with the virtual infrastructures, but this computer was like 10 years old and it was under a desk. It was first before it was uh, an endpoint for the user and then it was turned into a server for some certain activities. So after compromising those machines, other endpoints uh, running 24-7 uh, got the encryption phase. And why they were powered on? Well, because they had to. Since our customers are public administrations, some of them also run a public safety service, like could something could be like local police. So those computers had to be operational on Saturday night. But in other cases, it was just lazy owners that they didn't switch off their computers when going home. So they learned the hard way, losing their data, that they should not waste electricity and switch off the computers. So the attacker's success was a combination of weekend and unattended endpoints. Then we come to the reaction phase. It was Monday morning, about 8 in 8 a.m., that the first reports of inaccessible files were coming in through mail, through talk, uh, web chats, and especially through the old fashioned telephone. And within 30 minutes, we managed to stop the spread of the encryption. Uh, this is another thing, another lesson we learned is that work from home was a big plus. Uh, for example, there is no limit to the number of expertise that you can involve in a matter of seconds. And you don't need to wait for everyone to get to the office building. So we were all operational just in a matter of minutes. I was there in a, in a web call that started growing and growing and growing. We came to have more than 20 people in the meeting. And just imagine 
20 more people around the physical table and just have one person speak at the time. We are Italians, we are Latins, we, we cannot do that. Uh, but when you are on a virtual meeting, that, that is possible. You have no background noise from side talks. They do occur uh, when you have to tell something to someone, someone else, you write it in text in the common chat or in separate chats. So it's silent and it's really very, very effective. Uh, but having separate chats has a drawback. After a few days working on the case, it happens that you know that someone told you something that wrote it, some, wrote it in a chat, but you cannot find it anymore. So uh, we think it's a good uh, habit to have a notepad, your own notepad. And it's better if, if it is tamper, tamper resistant, like pen and paper. Just don't forget to bring it with you if you go physically to your office. Uh, well, we were lucky that the reaction task force was composed of senior IT staff. That means people with gray hair, with 10 or more years of experience within our company and the customers. So that means we knew the infrastructure by heart. So whenever we need an information, the lookup was much faster when searching it in a human memory rather than searching it on a tool. And by the way, the human memory uh, cannot be compromised. Uh, for example, this kind of information is like an IP subnet, where is it physically located? The customer, in, the customer in this case has like 20 or 30 different physical buildings spread over a geographical area. And it was very important to be able to locate where a mach compromised machine was. Uh, also, the domain <clears throat> controllers uh, of the customer were planned, were scheduled to be updated in the upcoming weeks. So the, our Windows IT staff was already trained to build and rebuild domain controllers from scratch. So they knew exactly what to do when they had to rebuild it and just feed the backup from a few weeks earlier. So the fact is that we were very effective as everyone knew his own role. Uh, and also some hatches were buried from years long stories. Also years long relationship with the customers allowed us to limit their operations uh, temporarily for a few days until we understood how things were moving and what we could open back again. For example, we had to close the remote desktops and all forms of uh, remote assistance like Team Viewer and stuff like that. They were very understanding because they knew we were doing it for their own good. So it was very good to have their trust. Last but not least, well, enterprise grade backups, they do cost a lot but greatly limited the damage. It was just a matter of time to restore backups. A lot of data, but data was there. So uh, what we will do to prevent further attacks? Uh, well, we think we need to develop a sixth sense for anom anomalies in the user activities that are traced in the logs. Maybe artificial intelligence will come to the rescue, but still, but in the time being, we need to do it as humans. We need to reevaluate the importance of existing alerts because some of them were probably ignored or we, we didn't give them enough importance and we might have uh, stopped the attack if we were right on that spot. We will ingest more logs that are available, but we're not producing alerts, not yet. And we are in the fine section and the fine tuning of them because they're just producing too much alerts to be useful. And something we would like to do is some red and blue team training and activities because there are many free resources online. It really helps even newcomers to get into the infrastructure to get into new technologies, even if they see it 
uh, in a training quickly, but when you then when you need it, you just know that you can do it. That that was the case for myself. That I was thrown into an elastic search instance uh, that I had seen just in uh, maybe ten minutes one year before. Finally, define which open source intelligence sources we should monitor. Twitter is full of it but we need to focus on some of them, otherwise you lose track of the information and it really takes a lot of time. And adopt also some closing sources because we later discovered that from a closing source, we would have known that those credentials were on sale on the dark web. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, you, you, can, reach them. you can reach us by email and good luck.